So, you're a sneaky black hat, huh? Big old sneaky black hat. We're all sneaky black hats around here. And this, this is your target network. This is the sort of thing you're after. Did a bit of reconnaissance. We've got a pretty standard kind of segmented network infrastructure. A couple of firewalls, one internet facing, one facing the internal network. Uh, we've got a service segment with a couple of interesting boxes, one of which happens to be our target database server. We've got a DMZ segment, mail server. Uh, and interestingly enough, on the desktop LAN, hmm, there's the admin. So we want to get through those firewalls into that database server. Now, firewalls said, no, no one's going to let that database server talk out to the public internet. Maybe a few Windows updates, something nasty like that. In this case, it happens to be running a sensible operating system like Linux. So how are we going to get there? Well, the plan looks something like this. Hmm. Maybe the admin's the way to do it. Mail headers say he runs Pine. That's uh, all the goodness of WooFTPD in a mail client. Uh, I happen to use Pine, by the way. Sorry. Uh, mail signature has got one of those auto-generated sig things. Tells us what kernel he's running, what sort of li uh, Linux it is. In this case, Debian Sarge. Mm -hmm. Sensible. 2422, slightly old kernel. Mm, could come in handy. And the web logs seem to suggest outbound HTTPS isn't filtered. Hmm. Because we can see the connections coming from their NATing router instead of their proxy server. So that sounds good, yeah. Outbound connection on port 443 TCP. Mm -hmm. So this is the plan. We take my zero-day pine exploit, which we can deliver as an email message via SMTP. We punch it on through to their mail server. We wait for the admin to pick up his mail. We exploit his pine. All good. Better connect back shellcode out to our netcat listening out in the public internet somewhere, back into his box, rootkit it up good and proper, and then we'll sit around, we'll wait for him to log into the database server, we'll sniff his password, and off we go. Sounds like a pretty good plan to me. I, I reckon that'd work. So let's give it a try. Fire up my uh, pretty leap pine zero day. Nice uh, innocuous mail. Yeah, he, he probably opened that. You know, he's, he's always up for opportunities, that guy. And out on the internet, yeah, fire up that netcat listener on port 1337 TCP, as you do. And oh, look at that. Root shell, uh, admin shell on his box. As you can see, we got UID admin. That's pretty good. It's not root, but, you know, it'll do for now. Hmm. But where'd that pine go? Hmm. PSAOX, pipe for grip. Ooh, no pine. Shit. Must have killed it. Mm. And you know, he's probably going to notice that. Mm. That wasn't, wasn't quite going according to plan. Mm. Oh dear. Oh well, let's get that rootkit in real fast and uh, maybe we'll get away with it. Ooh. Goddamn, goddamn Linux Kernel of the Month Club members. Man, look at that. Around 2422 for ages and now he's running some crazy 2.6 thing. <laughs> rootkit. Mm. That, that beautiful Kernel Mo rootkit I built. It's not going to work. Goddamn. And he's got be, to be wondering where that pine went, huh? Ooh, and we're not very stealthy. Look at us. Geez, Hacksaw.com. It wasn't a very good choice for a vanity reverse, was it? He's probably going to probably gonna spot us. Hmm. Oh, yeah, there we go. Look, brand new shell. Oh, dear. He's going to start looking. Right about now, if you're a sensible man, if you're a resourceful hacker, you know, you thought, it's time to cut your losses. You know when, when the game is up. And yeah, it's just, it's just time to drop carrier and run because you're busted, you're screwed up, you drop core with your exploit, oh dear. And we haven't even got root yet. How disappointing. But, hmm, what was that a second ago? Ooh, SSH, root at ns1.target. Hmm, hang on a sec, back on our network diagram, we'll remember, there was a name server in that segment where, this, where the database server was. Hmm, once you get the same layer 2 segment, and that's a root shell too. Once we're on the same layer 2 segment, we got root. No problems there, right? Hmm. God damn. If only we had root right now, that would be really good. But so close, man, so close. Just having that root shell right there in your face, taunting you, taunting you. But you've got to drop carrier, right? You don't want to end up like our good friend, Mr. Kevin Mitnick. So plus, 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 ADH naught, get the hell out of there. But man, so close. Like that... I was sitting there, right, looking at that SSH in the, in, the, in the PS output, and it just taunted me. And it's like, if only, right, if only there was a way to get to the other end of that SSH session right now. Not when I sniff the password. 
Not, you know, after I've chosen the SSH binary to log stuff, no. Right now, logged in, there's a running SSH session, I want that. If only there were a way to do it. Well, as you can probably guess, there is. Uh, you can't read the small print, uh, I'll explain it in a second, but uh, you get the general gist. We've got a netcat listing down the bottom there. We run some little magic happy stuff, which you'll see in a bit. And oh, look at that, you got yourself pwned. Terrible for you. So yeah, uh, my name's Adam, uh, also Metalstorm, as you can see from the, the pretty logo. Uh, I'm from New Zealand, I'm the, one of the token foreigners. Uh, for those of you not familiar, New Zealand's a, a very small island in the South Pacific, about that big. As you can see on Google Maps, put an arrow there for your reference. It's primarily populated by sheep, so we don't have a lot of, uh, of information security professionals. Uh, there's a few hobbits, apparently. Uh, yeah, that whole Lord of the Rings thing kind of said, everyone's, yeah, everyone's like, do you have hairy feet, man? It's like, just leave me alone, I'm not a hobbit, all right? I work uh, for a Linux systems integrator. Uh, we actually, I don't do a lot of security uh, professionally, so I'm, I'm actually here in kind of a, a, an amateur uh, spare time sort of capacity. But uh, I, yeah, I've been a corporate or security consultant for, I got, got a bit tired. Uh, I've been a network monkey, you know, all, all sorts of stuff. I'll, I'll tell you crazy ISP stories, you know, from uh, out in the edge of the world. Uh, we have to build satellite links out of pieces of string. But it teaches you good networking skills, which will come in handy. So yeah, what the fuck just happened? Well, you saw a pretty standard intrusion, right? Boring old network. I thought I had a really pretty good plan of how I was gonna get in, right? The modus operandi that we were using is we're gonna attack the servers via the administrators. Now, those of you who, uh, who run Linux desktops uh, are probably uh, fairly few and far between. I'm, I'm one of them, but uh, in general, right, desktop environments are, are significantly more complex uh, than your average server environment. And these days, if you're looking for bugs, you're looking for interesting things, there are always you know, lots of string parsing, lots of you know, mime handling, all the sort of things where stuff goes horribly wrong. Most of that's on the desktop. You know, all that, all the, yeah, like a little paperclip guy, right? All that, all that kind of candy that rots your brain. It's like intellectual candy floss, or whatever, what do you call it over here? Uh, cotton candy, yeah. But in this case, things went wrong. And yeah, you could, you could drop carrot and run. Or you could display a little adaptability, do something a little different. And uh, that's, that's what I like to think this is. It's a little, little different. So, post-intrusion, if you're a hacker, what are your goals? Well, usually you need to escalate privileges. You need to get root on the local machine. From there, you're in a very good position to consolidate yourself, you know, get your root kit in place, uh, you know, Trojan everything up the wazoo. Uh, and, you know, really, once you're in, in position there, then usually you're on your way somewhere, right? You've got a target. Very rarely you do, you, you know, just someone gives you a root shell on where you want to go, right? I mean, it's not, you know, it's not 1993 anymore. So often, you're on your way to somewhere else. So you sit around, you do some reconnaissance, you sniff some packets, you know, you crack some passwords, and, and you carry on. Now, sometimes I like to do things a little differently. Like, you think more like a gorilla, right? You haven't got a lot of time, you move in, you hit fast, and you get the hell out of there very, very quickly. And maybe, maybe you don't need to do all those other things, but we'll, we'll see. But yeah, displaying adaptability, I think, is, is a pretty, pretty you know, important thing here. Um, it's, you know, things, things very rarely ever go to plan. Often your reconnaissance isn't accurate. You know, you don't have all the information that you need up front. So yeah, you display a bit of adaptability. Um, and hopefully, that's one of the, uh, the differences between, you know, us hairy hackers and, uh, you know, the people with ties who you pay to uh, test your networks. Now, cross-host privilege escalation. There's, uh, it's a term I made up. Probably someone else got a better word for it. Local root, maybe it's a distraction. You know, root on, on another box is probably just as good as root on this box. And I was sitting there thinking about that root shell, you know, that SSH with a root shell on the other end, and I thought, you know, I don't care about root on this guy's workstation. Screw him, right? I want root on that name server. You know, local vulnerabilities, it's, it's very easy to exploit. Sometimes, you know, you, you feel like you have to. It's kind of the routine you get into. You have to rootkit the box. It's all very tedious. You know, nine to five, punch in, punch out, rootkit. And it's easy, right? It's satisfying. It's good. It feels good. You find a local privilege escalation vulnerability in some sewered binary. Yeah, and it feels good. You're doing your job. But, yeah, that's easy. But what if there was something even easier? 
Aha, trust relationships. You remember these from like, you know, 1983, back when everybody trusted everybody, you know, we're all, no one locks their houses and, you know. It's kind of old school. You, know, you remember our hosts? I'm sure Kevin Mitnick remembers these things. And back when you know, ports below 1024 just magically gave you root, right? I mean, these are the good old, these are the things that really give you that warm, you know, nostalgia feeling, you know. You just want to eat your mom's apple pie. Apple crumble in New Zealand, but, yeah. And, then, and that sort of thing, like exporting slash read write to the world, right? I mean, that's, that's hey, we're a bunch of long-haired Unix hippies, right? You know, share the love around. That's what uh, our good friend Mr. Stallman would say. But uh, that stuff seemed kind of good, right? You could have a beer, you could, you could get some root. It was nice and easy. You didn't have to think so much. All this, you know, kind of disassembly and stuff, all very difficult. I, I, I like trust relations. They're good. They feel good. It's weird. <laughs> we, we, that we even call that hacking, right? I mean, you see the, the old movies of, of Simple Nomad getting root by mounting stuff, right? That's, uh, those were the good old days. One of the things I really like about trust relationships is that, that instant gratification thing. I like instant gratification. I like just, you know, you see root, you get root, right? That's fun. That's good. Instant gratification. That's, that's my sort of sploit, right? So I'm, I decided to break trusts into two categories. Uh, what I'm calling non-transient trust. Obviously, this talk is called trust transient, so it's obviously a transient trust. So non-transient trusts, which is, that's your traditional sort of trusts, right? That's your, your R hosts. It's uh, things like SSH trust. Essentially, it's, it's a, a stored authentication credential, either on the client side, like an SSH trust uh, with your private key, or on the server side, in the case of something like R hosts, or, or things that trust ports below 1024, or trust ident response, or whatever. It's uh, what Bruce Schneier might call one-factor auth, uh, if he were here. It's uh, authentication, uh, in some cases, based on, on the properties of the connection, the, the source address, the IP. The, uh, the port number, that sort of thing. And then we have the, the other half of trust, uh, which I've called transient trust. They're trust relationships that change over time. So during authentication, a trust relationship that exists only for a period of time, so yeah, and change over time. Um, really, during the authentication process, there's some sort of you know, strong authentication, uh, you know, PKI or whatever, but after we've con uh, completed that authentication phase, we have essentially a trust relationship for the duration of that connection. And unless you're going to personally, by hand, authenticate every single packet, right, then you have to accept that there's some degree of trust in every open connection. So let's look at some, uh, some metrics by which we're going to evaluate uh, methods for exploiting trust relationships. Uh, I've just, just kind of picked a couple. Um, in this case, uh, I'm going to rate them from 1 to 10 uh, for ease of use, you know, how, how straightforward it is, how understandable, how little work you have to do, uh, how stealthy it is, you know, how, how sneaky you can be, how much effort you have to go to hide uh, what you're doing. When, how, how close to just right the hell now can you go ahead and do this? Uh, and finally, just a general idea of how feasible it is, how often you're going to run into a scenario where you can use this particular type of attack. Um, and for the purposes of this exercise, we're going to assume that we've just acquired a non-root shell uh, on a box, like we did in the example. So, the first, and probably the best way, right, is we exploit a classic non-transient trust, like, you know, an R host or something. So, we can pretend to be client A so that the server trusts us. Now, that's pretty easy, right? I mean, you, you don't get much easier than that. Uh, it's stealthy, I and mean, the user doesn't know that you know about his trust relationship. The only thing that, that is secret about a trust relationship is that it exists. When? Yeah, right now. That's all good. Uh, feasible? Yeah. I'd like there to be trust relationships everywhere, and that would be good, right? Like SSH root at, you know, gov.nz, and it would let me in. That would be sweet. But no. Not very feasible, because, you know, people have finally kind of understood that exporting slash read-write via NFS to the entire world is, you know, not, not so desirable. Ah, pretty universal technique. Everyone, uh, everyone's done this at some point, I'm sure. Key logging. So during authentication, um, and this is kind of a, a more of an attack on transient trust because during authentication we steal the credentials and then later on we use them. So yeah, we impersonate user A using 
the stolen credentials. Yeah, pretty straightforward, nice and easy. You know, everyone understands how to do it. There's all manner of ways you can key log things. You know, you can have key loggers uh, right out by the hardware. You can have, uh, you know, you can Trojan the SSH to dump the password. There's all sorts of stuff you can do. And uh, well, well understood stuff. Stealthy, yeah, sure, done right. Pretty good. I'm sure you've all seen that, uh, that hoax about the Dell keyboard with the built-in key logger that dumps the packets over the Ethernet. Yeah. Uh, when the uh, downside is you have to wait until the user goes to authenticate. And, that, and that, in our case, right, where we, we've busted in, we're about to get busted ourselves, um, and we don't have time to Trojan the binary and wait for the guy to log in again. So mm, not so good on the when front. But overall feasibility, pretty damn good. If you can get root or you can get into a position where you can sniff the keystrokes, you know, you've, you can talk to his X server or something, then yeah, it's, it's a pretty good attack, pretty good all-rounder. Man in the middle technique, right? You've got an open running post authentication connection. You should be able to just go ahead and steal that puppy, right? Pretty classic technique against, uh, against Telnet. Uh, so in this case, yeah, we impersonate the server to the client and the client to the server. We sit in the middle, we pass the packets back and forth, and then later on we can uh, either monitor the session uh, or we can go ahead and take it over. Not so easy. I mean, uh, if you can see the packets, yeah, it's all good. Um, if, you know, if you've got root and you, you, can, you can sniff the packets, you can put the interface in promiscuous mode, yeah, you can see the sequence numbers, you're doing well. Stealthy, not so good. I mean, you can often hijack the connection in the middle um, without the user knowing, but if you want to actually inject something, you're going to bust their connection. Uh, when? Hmm, it's kind of difficult because these days you don't see many clear text protocols. There's a lot of SSH, which you're going to have to hijack right at the beginning um, using, you know, Man in the middle, uh, like Doug Song's Man in the Middle SSH uh, hijacker, which is pretty cool. Um, but yeah, so with connections with encryption, strong authentication, yeah, it's kind of a problem. Overall feasibility, still okay, but uh, hmm, it's, it's not as good as key logging. The classic TCP hijack, that's uh, quite similar. Uh, you've been used successfully in the past. Uh, Kevin Mitnick, of course, deployed it against Shimamura. Uh, quite a you know, classic attack. It's not so straightforward these days. People have decent random number generators on their uh, TCP sequences. Yeah, and uh, it's not so stealthy. You know, you're going to bust the connection. Someone's going to notice unless they're not at their desk. When? When is good, right? This is one of the reasons I like this, right? You can take a running connection, uh, and you can go ahead and you can you can go ahead and hijack it anytime you like. That's good as long as it's running. Uh, but overall feasibility these days, uh, with you know proper authentication and encryption, uh, it's uh, it's not as common as it used to be. Yeah, it's a good party trick against the the occasional telnet. But overall, yeah, not so hot. Uh -huh. But this one, this one is kind of interesting. How about after we've authenticated and we've got that running connection, we go ahead and, and we take over the client software, which already has the socket. We don't have to worry about any jiggery pokery with sequence numbers. We just go ahead and take the socket away from the application. We use it for our own purposes. It's already authenticated at the other end. There's already that transient trust relationship between the client and the server. Hmm, that sounds pretty good, huh? Surprisingly enough, it's actually quite easy. I, I gave it an 8 out of 10 for ease. That's pretty good. Stealthy, yes, you do it right, which hopefully I do. Yeah, it's pretty stealthy. Mm. When? Mm, very close to right now. That's good. Uh, and overall feasibility? Yeah, you see a lot. Of, I mean, like I know my desktop, right? I've probably got 20, 30 SSH connections open all over the goddamn place. You root my box? Well, there, there's a whole lot of root shells for you. So yeah, I think overall feasibility, pretty damn good. Hmm. Now this, this exploiting the application thing, right? It's, it's a slightly different um, MO to your, to your normal attack, right? Because really what you want to maximize your chances is you want as many users logged in as possible running as many applications as possible because you're going to sneak down those connections. So it's different in that we want to attack, right? We want to do it during peak time, right? When everybody's sitting at their desk, we want to sneak in there and just take their shells away from them right when they're using them, which is, yeah, it's, it's, it's daylight robbery, right? You don't, no, no more sneaking around. Just get in there, take their shells. But if you can do it without them noticing, then even better, right? And, and the downside for me, I guess, is it, it's, it's not even really that technically challenging, sorry. Um, it's really, you know, it, it's, it's, just a, it's just a bugging, right? It's, it's creative reapplication of the, of the same tricks that virus writers and reverse engineers have been using for a while, which you'll see. So, I prepared a graph 
uh, which clearly demonstrates that my technique is wildly good. <laughs> no, but okay, seriously, I plotted the values on the graph, and it says that exploiting applications, you know, transient trust hijacking is, is almost as good as real trust relationships, which, which suggests I'm probably going to enjoy it. Isn't it a pretty graph? So, I present to you my SSH jacket. It's a, uh, it's a little Python script, which, when you point it at a running SSH process, gives you a shell at the other end. Just like that. We're going to go through a, a few details, how it works, um, some, some kind of nitty-gritty bits and pieces, um, how we uh, implement anti-forensic technique uh, whilst we're doing it, uh, a little bit of mitigation, not, not too much, don't worry. Um, and, yeah, the, the usual, you know, what, what else are we, uh, we going to do with it? Now, hopefully uh, everyone here is familiar with SSH, the SSH protocol. Um, it's, uh, it's quite an interesting protocol in that it's uh, essentially, a, I guess you could consider it a transport layer multiplexing protocol. Uh, you can run multiple sessions uh, across a single SSH session. Um, and it will allow you to you know, push shells around, push TCP sockets around, uh, you know, push arbitrary data around, uh, pipe it in and out. And it does this by using uh, what they call a virtual channel infrastructure over the top of their SSH connection. So uh, what we're going to do is, you know, because our goal is to take that SSH connection, get ourselves an SSH connection without interrupting the legitimate user. And this virtual channel stuff is going to help us uh, make it pretty seamless. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the features provided by the SSH protocol uh, and we're going to reuse them for a little bit of evil. What we're going to do is we're going to take a socket on one end and we're just going to glue it to a shell on the other end and plug a hacker in and he's all good. So, using Python uh, and uh, GDBMI, which is the GNU debugger's uh, programmatic interface, uh, we just go ahead and attach to a running SSH client. And then we have a good rummage around. We do some you know, kind of pattern signature scanning. Uh, and we find the code that's responsible for setting up the virtual channels. Um, and then, yeah, we, we just go ahead and patch that. Mm -hmm. to, uh, and, instead of talking to a, a local user out his, uh, his uh, pseudo TTY, uh, we'll just go ahead and, uh, and glue that to a socket, which is connected to us. And then we'll go ahead and ask for a shell on the other end. So, we patch up the code. And then, yeah, we just, we just go ahead and ask it to run it for us. Thanks. Thanks very much. That'll be nice. Mm -hmm. And it does. And then, a little bit of cleanup. And continues as if nothing happened. Except that, mm, yeah, shell just popped out our net cap. Terrible for you. Good for me. Hmm. I'd like to think this is the sort of stuff that your mother warns you about, right? Hackers are, hackers are sneaky buggers, right? Sneaky. We don't just, you know, we don't just install LIK4 anymore, right? Or bounce ISC proxies around, right? I mean, that's, that's all kind of passe, right? I'd like to display a little bit of creativity. Sort of thing that an expensive pen tester might do if you, you know, if, if you spent your money wisely. Hmm. So I mean, essentially what we're doing right, is just automated debugging, right? And of course, you give a human a debugger, you plug him into a process, of course we're going to do sneaky stuff, right? But what we're really aiming to do is we want to automate it. We want something that has the, I think on the next slide it says, yes, the, the sneakiness of a human and the reliability and the portability and the speed of a script. So we're going to use a GDB, uh, which is uh, the most excellent GNU debugger. Uh, we're going to use GDBM, GDBMI, which is the machine interface, uh, which is mm, it's not great, but it works. Uh, and I'm going to use Python. Python's a, a great kind of cross-platform scripting language. Uh, I like it. It has an interactive shell. It's good for you know, prototyping your code. Nice and fast. So we're going to glue those all together um, and use it as an automated debugging toolkit. Now, it's, um, what we're actually doing to the SSH client with this, it's... Uh, it's, it's less like debugging that you, you normally would use a debugger for and kind of you know, more like reverse engineering on the fly, uh, you know, programmatically. Um, a bit of binary analysis mixed in. 
Um, and yeah, a little bit of kind of virus technique. There's not many Unix viruses, but uh, those that are are quite instructional. Right, so we're going to look through a little bit of the, uh, of the nitty gritty of how it works. Um, a little bit about uh, the Python GDMI interface. Um, how we're going to find a safe place to stop the execution of the program. Finding the stuff that we have to, uh, have to mess with. Generating the evil code that we're going to wedge in there. Actually wedging it in and running it. Um, and you know, we're, we're, I'm discussing it obviously specifically with reference to my SSH jacker, but this, uh, th this sort of technique is quite generically applicable as you'll see. So yes, as I explained, uh, GDB is a good debugger. Um, I implemented a, a Python binding for it uh, just to make my life easier. It's, it's included on your CD, I guess, if you want to have a play with it. Uh, it's very, pretty basic. It has uh, all the functionality you'd need for, for writing an SSH jacker, obviously, uh, but not a hell of a lot else. But you know, it does the important things. You can, you can read and write memory. You can change registers. You can uh, mess around with stuff. Now. What we're going to do, right, we're going to stop the SSH process and go ahead and mess with it. Now, we can't do this just willy-nilly anywhere. I mean, SSH is normally it's a single-threaded process, right? There's no locking, there's no nothing, there's lots of globals. Uh, so we have to be quite careful about what we do. Um, and one of the interesting things is we have to find a, a safe place where we're going to stop execution, go ahead and run our alternate code path, return and have it continue running safely. So, you know, you have to rummage through the, uh, the source code a bit and, and find somewhere that looks quite likely. And obviously what you're looking for is, is I guess, the, the least deviation uh, from the normal functioning of the program. In this case, I had a, had a rummage around the main line. Uh, you may be f familiar with SSH. If you uh, open up uh, the command shell inside SSH, you hit the, uh, the escape sequence and C gives you a command shell. You can open up uh, new port forwards. Obviously, that has to be able to set up virtual channels because those things run over their things, over their, uh, over a virtual channel. So. I figure that's probably a pretty good place to have a look, figure out how it works, where can I safely create virtual channels. And funnily enough, yeah, right there in the main line, it sits in that select most of the time. That sounds like a, like a, a pretty good place. So what we're going to do is we're going to attach our debugger to the process, just stop it where the hell it is, rummage around and see if we can't find that safe place. Uh, and then we're going to drop a breakpoint there. Just like that. But where the hell is select? We don't have any debug symbols unless you built your own SSH and you know, that's obviously not going to run on someone else's production box. So yeah, we don't have any debug symbols. How the hell are we going to find select? Well, anyone who's done, done any sort of reverse engineering binary analysis you know, is familiar with this sort of technique. Pretty standard sort of stuff, right? We work backwards from where we can find select, which happens to be where it's imported from libc into the address space of our, uh, of our binary and memory. So we rummage around. We find it uh, in libc. And then we walk backwards uh, through the global offset table and the procedure linkage table. Uh, and eventually we find calls in the main line to the PLT entry for select. Now in this case, uh, it was actually quite lucky. There's one call to select in the whole goddamn binary. Um, so I didn't even have to bother putting a breakpoint in the main line. Uh, I just went ahead and put it in, in the PLT. It jumps through the PLT on the way. Um, so yeah, we just drop a breakpoint in there. Pretty good. So we found select. That's good. Now, next interesting thing we have to find uh, is where that virtual channel setup code is that we're going to go ahead and patch. Uh, in this case, it's a function called uh, SSH session 2 open. Uh, it's for the protocol version 2. Um, you have to find that. Still no debug symbols, of course. Um, fortunately for us, there's a fairly unique error message in there. Uh, in this case, uh, the dupe fails uh, and it whinges about it. With, and fortunately, it's the only place uh, that, that that string is used anywhere in the binary. So in this case, we find the, uh, the data section, the read-only data section of the, of the ELF binary and memory. We rummage around, we find that string, and then we wander through the code segment uh, until we find references to that string. And at that point, we, we know we're at a roughly sensible offset uh, inside that function that we're looking for, is safe session to open. Now, the actual evil code itself, well, what's it going to do? Well, we're going to replace the first half of the virtual channel setup code. We're going to uh, save the registers um, before we execute, obviously, so we don't uh, interrupt the smooth execution of the program. Uh, and we're going to restore them afterwards. Um, essentially, what we're going to do is we're going to inject some shell code. Uh, and that's going to, you know, pretty standard sort of boring shell code. It's going to run socket. It's going to run connect. Um, once we've got that, uh, that socket connected, we're going to uh, 
put it in place of where SSH would normally expect to find a local file handle to your TTY uh, when you normally request a shell. So we're just going to glue that puppy together, right? It's a, the joy of Unix, right? This whole files and sockets being the same thing. That's good. I like that. And then when it's finished, yeah, we're going to leave everything just as we found it, stack unmangled, you know, nice and clean. Uh, and the the, uh, the shell code that I'm using, uh, it uses libc calls uh, for no no really good reason. I could have just used kernel calls, but I figure I had libc there. I might as well use it. Now this may sound a little funny, right? I, I'm overwriting half the function. You might have thought it would be easier to just go ahead and, and bring my own function that, that does everything I need. And yes, that would have been probably easier in retrospect. But it's not. Uh, it's not quite as smooth as it seems. SSH is a, uh, is a nasty, nasty thing. They use a lot of kind of that, that data-driven metaphor. So there's lots of big global arrays of function pointers that you have to mangle with, and then everything is asynchronous, and you have to you know, stick callbacks here and there. It's, it's really quite messy. And what I was trying to avoid is having to link anything by hand at runtime with no symbol information. Uh, that's, that's a pretty tedious process. So I thought, and I can just take a function that does most of what I want, chop off the top bit, which doesn't have anything that needs linking in it, uh, and just glue my stuff on the top. That'll save me a whole bunch of bother, and it did. The downside of that um, is that yeah, you have to handcraft it for each SSH binary. That's ah uh, yeah, that's pretty sucky uh, because we don't have enough information to write this uh, until runtime. So uh, yeah, we'll just go ahead and generate bits and pieces. We um we have some shell code. It has some holes in it. We collect some data because when we have a whole debugger of it, we can disassemble the damn thing if we need to to find out what information we need to write correct shell code on the fly. Um, so yeah, that's what we do. So we find that unique error message. We work backwards until we find the beginning of the function, uh, and we collect a little bit of data. We you know collect some things about the stack size. Um, and we patch in uh, a few bits and pieces that we've discovered along the way, uh, the PLT entries for uh, socket and connect. Uh, and we go ahead and we, uh, and we patch them in. Uh, also, of course, the, uh, the script accepts command line parameters, uh, so it's user friendly. We have to patch those into the shell code too. And finally, it's time to actually go ahead and, and, and wedge this evil code right into SSH. So yeah, we, we take a copy of the instruction pointer so we know where we were. We back up the code we're about to overwrite, and we just go ahead and wedge it on in on top of the function. And the idea is we, we get it just right, so the top half and the bottom half, you know, the register states just so halfway through the execution, so we can hand off to the other half of the function uh, with all the other difficult bits that I didn't want to link. And then we set a breakpoint at the end, so that we can uh, catch the end of the successful execution of our code. So we go ahead and we run it. And yeah, a bunch of a bunch of output happens. Uh, but the important thing is at the bottom, we got ourselves a netcat lister, and oh look, out pops our shell. And the guy, that, that little clip art dude, right? He's playing hump the wumpus as you do, right? And you, you, the wumpus is still going to kill him. This session's very much alive and well and living. Now, interesting question: How about SCP? You're just copying a file around. There's no, there's no shells involved. What, what about piping stuff over SSH? How many use rsync over SSH or CVS over SSH? How many people have SSH embedded in, in backup processes and stuff that shunts things around the network? You think that just, you know, data in one side, data out the other, it's just a pipe, right? That's all. Hmm, actually, no, you, you can do this on a running SCP. Hmm, oh dear. It's a, few, a few little difficult bits. Um, there's some client-side client checks uh, on whether or not we're supposed to be running a remote shell. Of course, we completely control the client, so those checks are, are just kind of you know, humorous. It's a little difficult. We uh, have to figure out if we're running a remote command. Um, one of the things uh, I did to try and uh, avoid having to find the bits of memory that tell me where, whether I'm running a remote command, it's much easier just to reparse argv. I found the piece of code that uh, does the argument parsing, and yeah, we'll just run that. So yeah, we read the argument strings, we figure out whether we're running a remote command, and we take a, a few little extra, extra steps just to make sure. Um, downside, uh, SCP connection doesn't get allocated to TTY by the server side, uh, so you get a pretty rough looking shell, but it's a root shell, right? I mean, any root shell is a good root shell, even if it doesn't have a TTY. And yeah, the other thing is uh, we are, I, I'm using, some, uh, using a signal to wake up the process after I finish debugging it, and we didn't have any signals 
uh, registered, any signal handle is registered in the case where we're just doing SCP or remote execution. Um, so I, I just went ahead and installed a signal handler. I mean, hey, we got a debugger, right? We can run arbitrary code on the fly, why not? Makes it uh, nice and smooth. So perhaps, perhaps you'd like to go home and jack yourself. Well, how would you go about that? Well, it, it, it's, it's, it's straightforward. What I did, and, and I guess uh, it's probably the, I hope, the easiest way, uh, is just go ahead and, and, and write yourself some hijack code. You want to know if it's possible to take the, the protocol that you're using uh, and, and make it do something interesting. In this case, give me a shell. So I wrote some code that uh, I hooked up to like a magic key press in the SSH client that would spawn me another shell to make sure that there's no problem on the server side with having, you know, two, three, four, five, six command shells running uh, for a single SSH session because it's not something that normally happens. And it turns out that it worked. So at that point, I knew, I knew it was possible. And then, yeah, it was quite good. The, uh, the compiler generated a bunch of code for me, and that was uh, quite a good pointer to writing my shell code. Nice and easy, none of this uh, you know, hard work or anything. Let's let the compiler do it, right? And then uh, I went ahead and implemented uh, hijacking for a binary that had debug symbols, so I didn't have to worry about all the signature scanning and stuff. Right? That, that's a relatively well understood problem. It's tedious, but you can do it. So yeah, I, I did it with a, you know, I built SSH with all the debugging symbols available, made it nice and easy. And once I, <clears throat> once I proved that it worked like that, it's uh, off to the tedious bits, which is you, you have to build a list of all the symbols you need. And in the case of SSH, it was it's pretty nasty. Uh, they have a whole bunch of just global crap and pointers everywhere. It's uh, yeah, it's it's a bit of a mess. So yeah, you got to you got to look at a whole big list of symbols, and then for every single symbol, you have to go ahead and, and come up with a strategy to find them all. Uh, tedious, but but eventually, you know, kind of fun. And then, yeah, write some cunning code to do so. Jack your fence for fun and profit. Um, and then, if you're really nice, you know, a little spinny round of Vision 1 here with the, the Hollywood OS and the shh and stuff, you know, so that you can sell it to security consultants or something. So, yeah, think about, think about all the things that you, you, you use SSH for, right? It, it, gets, it really gets around, right? It's, uh, I know it's all over my network. I mean, it's such a, it's such a useful thing. It's, you know, it's quite ubiquitous. One of the things uh, someone asked me at some point was uh, you can, uh, in the middle of your SSH connection, uh, you can smack the escape sequence uh, and ask it for a list of the virtual channels running over your, uh, over your session. Uh, does this, the hijack connection show up in that channel, in that list of channels? Yes, unfortunately it does. Of course, it's all client side. You want to go patch the code to remove it from the list, feel free. Uh, of course, you can still spot the file descriptors uh, open against your SSH process if you go and look, look in proc or wherever. Um, but I mean, how many of you wander around looking at the proc entries for your SSH clients while you're using them? I know I don't. And yeah, what happens when you log out? Um, I jack your SSH connection, you log out of yours. Well, if you've ever left uh, a port forward uh, open over your SSH and then you log out of the actual shell bit and your port forward's still open and running, you'll notice your SSH connection just seems to stop. The shell just waits for, the, uh, for that extra virtual channel to time out. Same thing happens here. Uh, so basically, you can take a very short running process, say a, a nightly SCP backup push, sneak a shell across it, and that connection will stay alive as long as you want, even after the SCP is done. It's pretty useful. So how does it work? Well, I mean, how, how compatible is it? Um, yeah, it requires a relatively recent Python, 2.2 two, two and up. I, I, it ought to work with 2.1. There's no good reason why not. Um, but I haven't got any Python that old knocking around at the moment. Uh, yeah, and it's, it's just stuffed to the brim uh, with uh, IA32 kind of specific thinking. Uh, unfortunately, I'm, a, I'm an Intel kind of guy. Terribly sorry about all your kind of PowerPC users. Yeah, you'll all be Intel users soon. Yeah, it should work with uh, pretty much anything. Uh, OpenSSH 3.3 anything. Um, I've tried it on, uh, on, on a few distributions. The stock even inside, Red Hat Enterprise 3, Red Hat 9. Uh, works on Slackware. Uh, the, the, I work with a guy who used to work with SUSE on the uh, AMD 64 GCC, and it, I don't know what they did to their compiler, but it, it generates code that's just just nuts, right? It doesn't even work. Um, so yeah, it, it's pretty broken on SUSE at the moment. So all you SUSE users have to wait for me to get a little sneaky. But yeah, so it does work. It works out of the box, um, and you know the the stuff that parses the disassembly of the existing binary to figure out the bits and pieces. It works reasonably well. Now, 
a little brief tangent, if, you, if you'll indulge me, um, into anti-forensic technique. Now, this, this, uh, this um, MO of, of moving fast, of, of getting in there, taking the user's shells whilst they're using them and just you know, not stopping to, to root kit up the local box, right? That's kind of risky, right? That, that, that level of you know, just, just going and doing your thing and, and hoping that no one notices you because you're so fast. You know, yeah, you do have to still take a few precautions. And I guess uh, you know, I take it, take it for granted when I'm doing things that uh, probably I shouldn't, that I don't want to get caught or sued or anything. Um, so yeah, anti-forensic technique. Now, I think the Grug is, is talking at this black hat. Uh, I think he's doing his anti-forensic talk that he did uh, last year at RuxCon. Uh, go and see it. I mean, it's, it's really very, very interesting. If you're uh, into doing forensic analysis or defeating forensic analysis, it's, you know, I'm, I'm just going to touch on a couple of little bits and pieces. Go and see his talk. It's good. So yeah, we're going to look at uh, how uh, anti-forensic technique and then specifically how we apply it, or how I applied it in uh, implementing the SSH jacket uh, and, and how well we're doing. So what are the bits that are, that are relevant to us? Well, the really the best thing, right, is, is don't don't leave anything on the disk, right? Don't don't touch it, right? We're going to use a, an a interpreted scripting language, so we're already in a pretty good position there. We're going to try and keep everything in memory because if everything's in memory, right, there's no tripwire to spot you. There's no no evidence on disk for people to you know go around and read the sectors after you deleted it. And then we're going to try and use only locally available tools and interpreters. Um, that way, we don't have to bring any of our own wild zero day and magic tables called zero day .gz that we download from you know hacksaw.com big damn giveaway we don't want them to be able to use their IDS to reconstruct our table full of goodness or whatever so yeah if we use a, a local interpreter a Turing complete interpreter right they they don't know what we did they know we did something but you know if they've got as far as figuring out they got themselves hacked they probably figured that we did something right so go ahead and, and use your local interpreter and if you're really good you just write your tools as you need them on the spot, right? If you get into a box, it's got Perl, suck. Well, you write your, write your tools on the spot in Perl. You need a port scanner, go ahead and write one in Python, in Bash if you have to, right? It's much better than, than bringing your own, you know, NMAP binary around. They can figure out where you compiled it. Nah, jeez. And then the other thing to avoid is, uh, is new network connections. You don't want any telltale reverse shells connecting out like we did earlier on, you know, outbound 443, bad idea. We want to avoid making new network connections. So wherever possible, we want to reuse our existing connections. Um, or if we have to, we hide in plain sight, you know, stick things inside DNS packets or whatever sort of, you know, sneakiness Dan Kaminsky's up to these days. So how do we do it? I mean, how does the, my SSH jacker how does it look uh, compared to those, those techniques? Well, not too bad. We, use, we do use general purpose tools. We use Python. You know, we're quite happy with whatever version of Python is knocking around. We only use standard Python libraries. That's, that's good. We use GDB. It's not guaranteed to be installed anywhere, I admit. Um, hopefully, you don't do a lot of debugging on your production servers. But bear in mind, this attack is primarily targeted towards desktop machines. And, and even if you, you, know, you get somewhere you find there is no GDB, well, you probably could install it, right? App get install GDB, that's pretty straightforward, you know, RPM. And I mean, what is, what is installing a standard package that, that exists in everyone's distribution going to tell them when they do their forensic analysis? Well, you know, maybe you're a good sysadmin, maybe you like installing things. I don't know. SSH, it's already encrypted, that's good. So uh, our SSH connections, uh, that if we, you know, we're running across, there's no, uh, no worry about the IDS sniffing that and figuring out what our, uh, our shell was up to. Uh, and yeah, we're sneaking down an existing SSH connection, so that's pretty good. You know, no IDS is going to spot extra stuff flying around. But yeah, where do I suck? Well, we've still got some Python code lying around the disk, right? At the moment, I can copy across my Python script, fire it up and run it. But yeah, that, that touches disk. That's not so good. Uh, and then, of course, there's the, uh, the connect back from the, the socket shell code that we inject. Um, that's a, a whole new connection for them to spot. And even worse, it's in the clear. That's not so good. So yeah, we need, we need to try a little bit harder. Uh, one quite obvious thing is if you came in via SSH and you want to get a TCP connection back, well, hey, that's what SSH does, right? It shovels TCP connections around inside encrypted tunnels for you. That's great. So if you're in a position to do that, excellent. Solved that problem. How about loading Python directly into memory? so we don't have to leave our scripts lying around disk with all the comments and the email me if it doesn't work kind of thing. So yeah, let, let's just go ahead and fire ourselves up a Python interpreter. Well, we ask it to read from standard and just go ahead and execute whatever it finds. That's good. 
and then maybe on the client side, we want to uh, build a little, you know, little encoder that takes an arbitrary Python script, compiles it, takes the bytecode, compresses it up, you know, base 64s it to get across whatever shells you had to bounce through to get there, um, and then write something on the other end that'll unpack and run it. That would, that would be pretty cool. Yeah, well, that, that's kind of what it did. Uh, so yeah, I wrote a thing called uh, Maffle Load. It's the MetalStorm's anti-forensic loader. Loader, I guess. Ah, uh, yeah. There was meant to be other things as well. I only got the loader done in time. So yeah, I wrote a script. Nice and easy. You run it on your local client. Uh, it generates encoded Python uh, bytecode on standard out. It does everything we talked about previously. And so if, you, if you're a clever hacker, uh, or if you're me, uh, you might use screens. Screens, are, uh, for those who are not familiar with it, with hopefully it's no one, um, it's a, a, effectively a terminal multiplexer. Uh, you can have multiple uh, running terminal sessions attached to your one terminal window. One of the things uh, that it does do that's really cool uh, is it has a function that allows you to execute a local script uh, and then send the output of that local script to your running shell, to your running uh, terminal, like you type the input in. So in this case, I go uh, control A, bang, 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 maffle load, and then pass it the, the script I want to run and the command line arguments, and it goes ahead, starts a Python interpreter on the, on the remote end, encodes it locally, sends it across, runs it just like I was there, except nothing touched disk. And that should work for pretty much any, any you know, Python script. Uh, if you have uh, dependencies you need, extra Python uh, <coughs> libraries you require, you can just go ahead and supply those on the command line as well. Yeah, it's so easy, right? You, you see the shell on the remote end, you, you smack control A, and it runs it on the other end. It's great, right? You don't even have to think about where you're running the code. You know, it's like, like the days when someone first invented a syscall proxy, right? It's really cool. So what else could we do? Um, at the moment, it just patches, patches the existing shell code. Um, it would be much cooler if it actually went ahead and assembled it on the fly with most dev or something. I don't think I don't know if Dave Atel's here or what, but yeah, you could do it some documentation, dude. That's uh, that's not so good. A pure Python debugger that would be really cool. Um, just go ahead, use ptrace, remove the dependency on GDB. That would make it kind of easier to deploy. Yeah, and of course the the IA32 thing. There's no reason it can't work uh, on any other platform. But ha, huh, this is the interesting thing. What other protocols <laughs> have virtual channel infrastructure? Well, the two that come to mind that you're going to see on client devices, mm, MSRDP uh, and Citrix, both of which support quite a similar sort of idea to SSH, virtual channels for shoveling things like uh, audio redirection around and drive mappings and COM port mappings and, and all that other stuff that you, you pay good money for in your, uh, in your thin client protocols. And of course, uh, all manner of, of domain-specific sneakiness, right? Once you've got a, a programmatic debugging toolkit, uh, you begin to see all sorts of you know, things you can hit with that hammer. Um, all manner of sneaky things. Now, being as it is that I'm from the Antipodes, you know, I'm not very fashionable, uh, so I'm not sure if, if blaming Theo for everything is still kind of the, the, you know, the thing to do around here. Uh, unfortunately, if it is, terribly sorry, it's not actually Theo's fault. It's, uh, it's technically a feature. Uh, the SSH protocol specification, I was quite surprised actually. The SSH protocol specification says multiple shells down an SSH connection is just fine. In fact, I think it's even a requirement of the spec. Um, the normal SSH clients you and I use don't do it. I don't see why not. It'd probably be quite useful, really. If we could get shells from the server back to the client, because you've got to remember an SSH, because of this whole virtual channel thing, the SSH client and the server are, are almost identical pieces of code. They, they have much of the same functionality. And there's no reason that the shell couldn't go ahead and send a packet, the server couldn't send a packet to the client saying, how about you give me a shell? Um, unfortunately, yeah, they thought of that. Uh, there's a piece of code which checks for it. Uh, it would be quite a sneaky backdoor if you wanted to, uh, to patch the client to allow server shells backwards. Um, then if you owned a big shell host, you could kind of spread out from there. Um, <clears throat> and also uh, unsolicited server to client port forwarding. That would be pretty cool. SSH client connects to your malicious server. You open up uh, a port forward backwards. Uh, unfortunately, once again, there's code to think about that. Now, of course, I've only looked at open SSH. Uh, if you have other SSH implementations that are uh, less trustworthy, perhaps you might want to have a look and just make sure that uh, they don't go ahead and implement that. Like, I mean, everyone uses PuTTY on Windows, right? Who knows what that does? Uh, probably should read that sometime. But yeah, 
Open SSH is cool. This is entirely not their fault. Uh, if you get your SSH connections Jack, then don't go crying to Theo. Come and abuse me instead, please. I don't want Theo to get mad at me and flame me. Ah. So, mitigation technique. Like the sorry, the responsible bit of the talk begins here, right? First thing you do, just, just don't get rooted. That would be really good, right? That You mitigate a whole bunch of stuff right there. A couple of ideas. Uh, you could patch the kernel to restrict ptrace to root. I mean, on, a, on most machines, you, you don't really want your users debugging stuff. That's not a great solution. Uh, there's existing patches out there to do that. Um, I saw it suggested uh, as a, a kind of a loadable kernel module to use as a workaround against uh, one of the kernel priv escalation exploits that use ptrace. Um, you could do that. It's ugly. Um, funnily enough, the, uh, there's a program called SSH Agent, uh, which is responsible for uh, handing out your keys to people without you asking or something. Um, anyway, they kind of thought about this for SSH Agent, uh, and in, in the installs I've seen, uh, often you'll find it uh, it's, it's set GID. Um, on Linux, at least, you can't uh, ptrace attach uh, to a process that's set GID or set UID. Um, so in this case, yeah, this, this attack wouldn't work as non-root. Uh, against SSH agent, and you could you could set the GID bit on your SSH client. Now, of course, that comes with a whole bunch of other responsibilities, like making sure you can't leverage the fact that it's set GID uh, to mess with other people's SSH clients. Uh, so I'd probably be kind of careful before I did that. Um, one of the most important things you can do um, is where this is, is a really powerful attack is where we have automated SSH, where we have uh, trusts between hosts using uh, SSH uh, key authentication. Um, if you read the SSH man pages um, for the authorized hosts file, you'll find there's a whole bunch of directives you can use uh, to limit what a key can be used for. You can limit uh, what, uh, where the port forwarding is allowed, where the X forwarding is allowed, uh, where port forwards can connect to, what commands it can run locally. Right, that's very, very useful. If I find a, a trust relationship between two boxes and the key on the server side it says this is only valid for executing, you know, user games hunt the wumpus, Right, then I can't get a shell out of that. It's only going to give me more, more games of Wampus, right? and I can play that at home. So that's, that's a, a really good thing. And of course, my personal favorite mitigation technique right, is Steve Gibson. Right, He's got it all sorted out. That raw sockets thing, right? raw sockets wildly evil. Well, so are debuggers. Let's just go ahead and get Microsoft to take debuggers out of their operating systems. And I'll, I'll write an email to Richard Stallman and tell him I want him to you know, RMRF his GDB tree. That, that'd be pretty good. Mm -hmm. So yeah, why do, why do you care? Well, well, probably yeah, probably you don't, right? It's 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 nothing you didn't already know, right? I mean, I get a debugger, I can see a process, I can attach to it, I can make it do sneaky stuff. What do you do? Yeah, and if you get rooted by your screen, if, if this is this is nothing wildly wildly different. The only thing I think is is really interesting is attacking server systems through client systems, right? We see that in the Windows world all the time, right? That's the way you do it. You send someone an Outlook, you know, click on my dancing bears or whatever, uh, and you run it, and then from there you can go ahead and route the service. So that's a, you know, that's a pretty standard technique. It applies applicably um, on, on Linux desktops as well. Um, and of course, yeah, the, the really interesting one would be similar attacks against um, against ICA and against MSRDP. And I've, I've talked to a few Windows bunnies about this, and there's a couple of people kind of playing with this idea um, for Citrix. So you, you might see something interesting relatively soon. Yeah, hackers made me do it. It's not my fault. I, I was brainwashed. Uh, I went to Ruxcon. Uh, I saw some, some good talks. And yeah, it was, uh, I became evil. It was terrible. Yeah, and the Grug, uh, if, you, if you get to go and see his talk, please do. Uh, there's a guy called Sean Close, Australian guy. Uh, he wrote this, uh, this co-resident co elf encryptor thing. We've got two processes that both debug each other and then kind of page memory in and out of each other and decrypt it on the fire. It's, it's just insane. I have no idea how he wrote it and stayed, stayed sane. Um, if you ever want to try doing copy protection in a Linux environment, or you want to prevent your Linux binaries from being reverse engineered, go try out Shiva. It's... it's it's just nuts, right? I mean, it, uh, it, it, was, it was pretty cool. I was sitting in the audience going, man, that, that, this is a crazy motherfucker right there. <laughs> and, uh, and Silvio, um, that's another Australian guy, uh, you know, real godfather in the, in the virus scene. Uh, he had a few good ideas. Um, and then, yeah, there's, there's not much of a security scene in New Zealand. Um, I suppose I have to at least say hi to some of them. You know, hi, Mum. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, NZ ISIG, NZ2600, um, Southern Lights, who... Uh, New Zealand's only kind of hacker crew for a while there. Went very stealthy, got, yeah, yeah, dear, dear. 
And yeah, there's a guy called Gnu Spice who gave me a copy of Cheswick and Bellavan many years ago, uh, which was the start of my career as a, as a good evil person. All right, I, uh, yeah, the other demo time, right? Everybody, everybody loves to see the demo. Assuming we've got time, maybe, how's the symbols for the time? All good? It's all good. I, Right, you have to excuse me because uh, I can't see it on my screen at the same time, so this may be a little, a little furry. Oh, jeez. Uh huh. Actually, I'll just set it up. I'll, I'll flip back uh, in a second. Uh, yeah, we are way ahead here. Got a big old neck cat right here. All right, so in the uh, lower left-hand corner, uh, I just SSH uh, to localhost as root, so from user me uh, to root on my local machine. I'm running top, you know, something interactive. Uh, top, we have a nice, uh, nice net cap listing on uh, port 1337, quite appropriate. Uh, and on the right-hand side, down about, where the hell's my mouse? No, there it is. Goddamn mouse focus. And over there we have the SSH jacker. I plugged in the process ID of the SSH client. And you just keep an eye on that netcat up the top there. And if you're cunning, you'll note that the top will still be running at the end. Hmm. <laughs> Demo curse, huh? Did I forget to smack enter up there? Die. Jeez. Let's try that again. One of the great things about this is you can open up as many virtual channels as you like. So you want a dozen shells out the other end, it's all good. Where's that pesky mouse? Oh, look. The root shell. How nice. So yeah, that's the, uh, that's the money shot. Right there, everybody loves that, huh? Use that open office. And finally, yeah. If you want to spam me, uh, that's, my, that's my email address. And yeah, questions. Uh, I, I'm sure this is all, you know, it's just a party trip with a debugger, guys, so hopefully you've you got a few questions to kind of shred me up a bit. Sorry? Okay. Um, the connections from the client to your Netcat listener, yes, you can see those. Uh, so obviously you want to keep it as quick as possible. Um, if you were cunning and you came in across SSH, you could uh, run them locally across localhost, uh, port forward them back to your, wherever you're coming from. At least then they, you know, they wouldn't be going past an IDS somewhere. But yes, they do show up in your local net stat. If you happen to be root, I mean, obviously you can only ptrace attach the processes that are the same user ID as you. Um, or if you're root, you can attach to anybody. If you're root, then yeah, you could also hook up your rootkit to Trojan, uh, Trojan the output of NetStat, all the usual techniques for hiding a connection. But yeah, it does, it does show up, unfortunately. That's all good. Thank you very much.